Hey everybody, it is my big honor to be sitting here with somebody I'm very proud to call my mentor, but also very good friend, Dr. Bob Bailey. And uh, Bob is an icon, icon of animal training. So um, some of you may know Bob Bailey and his late wife, Dr. Marion Bailey. They ran an amazing animal facility um, that trained animals how many how many different animals do you guess that you trained over the years you worked there? Well, I know we trained in excess of 140 different kinds of animals. 150 different species of animals, and then if you had to say, about, like, did you guys take, keep track of how many different animals? Up to about 1983 or so, and then we quit. And they were at 15,000, actually beyond 15,000. So 15,000 different animals uh, that they trained. And, and if you were to say how many animals did we impact the training, I can answer that question and say it's probably in the millions now over the years because you have affected so many people's training and all of the animals that they have affected. It's like the domino, right? Well, you might be a much better judge of that than Absolutely, I. the big domino. So, um, and, and with all these animals, you might wonder, what the heck are they doing with these animals? So, a very large percentage of the animals were for commercial work, right? Sure, and, and quite literally for commercials, let's say. Um, that's one of the things that started the Breelands way back in 1943 is the thought of using animals to advertise things. And, and um, when we say the, the Breelands, so your late wife, Marion Bailey, was a, actually a PhD student of B.F. Skinner. So you might want to Google that one. And, and her first husband was another graduate stu student yes, of Dr. Skinner's, yes. correct? They were very early. Uh, the, probably first and second graduate students of B.F. Skinner. So you guys are like watching direct behavioral royalty right here. Like that, that's right. how we're rolling right here. And at the time, how many, how many trainers do you figure that were working for you guys, training all these animals? Well, it started as a small company in Minnesota and migrated to Hot Springs, Arkansas. That was in 1950. And when we were really training lots of animals to do lots of things, uh, we had uh, approximately 50 employees, of which uh, roughly 28, 30 were trainers awesome. of various grades. We had a hierarchy of, of trainers. Amazing. 30, and, 30 trainers. Yeah, and, and we had uh, capabilities, let's say uh, art and technical capabilities beyond that. Wow. Shop people. So, um, you're training these animals for commercials, and it, like, what kind of behaviors? That, that's the sort of thing we might be interested in. What kind of behaviors were these animals for the commercials? Well, all the way from, uh, let's see, the uh, what's called buck bunny, which was in the early 1950s, which was from a, uh, a bank, a savings and loan bank. And the bunny is putting money into a bank, which is a... A uh, replica of the building <laughs> in which this bank was located. That's and, hysterical. And uh, that bank had the, uh, call it the honor, if you will, uh, of being the longest running television commercial. It ran for <laughs> over 20 years. Holy smokes, is that still a record? As far as I know. So, Bob, uh, a, a, a big percentage of the time you guys spent trading was for the commercial endeavors. Mm hmm. But probably 15 to 20 percent of it was for the government, correct? Yes, beginning about 1965. You were training animals for the government. Mm -hmm. For one government or more than one? Uh, for, at that time, one government. And the question now might be, what would the government be doing with animals? Well, um, there were different uh, interests the government had in animals doing things. And the, the one that seems to be of most interest to people uh, is the, uh, are the clandestine activities. Mm, clandestine. Where, yeah, where, where animals did things that people didn't know about. Um, could we call that espionage? Yeah, you call it espionage okay. or spy. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, if anyone mm. is interested in some of the activities that we had, there is an article 
in the October um, Smithsonian Magazine, and it's about spy cats. Cool. The date was uh, 2013. Okay, October 2013. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and by the way, we did dogs also, but it turns out that the cats were of more direct interest. Do you hear that, all the you cat people out there? <laughs> they train cats for an espionage because, yes. and they tried dogs, but they went with cats. Yeah. Well, we 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 tried <laughs> and we trained them. It's just that it was not of as much use as far as the groups are concerned. And I'll say it was for the CIA uh, because they have said it was for the CIA. So I can say that without getting shot or anything. <laughs> So let's get down to the nitty gritty. You train these cats over a period of nine years, or use these cats for clandestine activities yeah. over a period of nine years. Um, what were these cats doing? Okay, first off, uh, let me say that it took from three to five years to fully train and instrument the cat. Wow. Depending on an individual cat and what the particular challenges were for that particular cat. And uh, the cats had a device installed in the ear, in the uh, middle uh, and inner ear, and it's called a cochlear implant, which, which now is quite common. Right, anybody who, who's heard that term before, it's how deaf people are able to hear. Was it the same? It's exactly, it was done by Robin Michelson at the Stanford Research Institute, and that's where the cochlear implant came from. Cool. Um, so anyway, the, the cats could be trained to be guided over long distances, anything line of sight. We had to be able to see the cat to guide it. Mm -hmm. uh, but line of sight, we guided it using high frequency sound called supersonic sound above the level of hearing of a human somewhere between 24, 25 kilohertz up to 37 kilohertz. And we could direct the cats up trees or just any, any place. And the cats became very focused on where they were going. We could guide them. The cochlear implant had nothing to do with uh, the cat being able to hear the guidance signals. It had to do with the information that the cat was hearing while it was next to someone, they were, we were bugging people's conversations, quite frankly. And so the, the cat would take it all in and then report it back to you? No, oh. the, the cat would transmit by radio. You could be a half a mile away and wow. listening to the conversation. Um, and and it, believe me, it was the finest microphone available. Wow. It was really incredible, the, the ability of these cats to hear. That's in, in very, let's say, low levels of conversation. So the cat would sit or lie. We, we did both. We, could, we trained the cat on one signal, it would lie down, another signal, it would sit. Or it would just follow people. We had the cat where it would follow people from one place to another. That's amazing. So you might be thinking, what does all ha this have to do with me training my dog or cat? And that's going to bring us to our next chat where Dr. Bob is going to share a story that he shared with me about the impact of training. And if you're saying there, well, my dog always comes when he's called except. If you have an except to that, or my dog always brings the ball back, except. We're gonna, you're gonna learn how to remove that except and how Bob did it with all of their animals in this phenomenal story that involves a seagull, a five mile retrieve, and a bald eagle. That's gonna come up in the next chat. Right, Bob? Okay, we'll do it. We'll see you then.